Good evening. Richard Mann is here, so we can get started. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. This is uh, this is truly a special event for us uh, for us here at Allen Hancock College, and uh, uh, we have uh, a special lecture tonight on the first NASA JPL launch, interplanetary launch from the West Coast. Uh, and we know you'll all be out there at the launch, you know, site 4 a.m. on Saturday. Um, so, uh, so um, if you're not going, they'll stream it online, right? Uh, but today's presentation is really part of a larger opportunity for our STEM program. Uh, by the way, I'm Kevin Walters. I'm the president of the college. I, usually this is all of our staff, and they know who I am. So, um, But uh, uh, a few months ago, we, I got a call from Richard Mann, and he was all excited because uh, these folks from NASA and the Jet Propulsion Laboratory had called, and they were going to do, uh, do the launch, and they wanted to have a whole week of... Uh, events around the campus and around the community and there are things going on in Lompoc and uh, things going on with the Discovery Museum and so um, for, for Richard and our college advancement team that have put this together and Richard's team, um, let's give them a round of applause for just putting this together. So um, this, this afternoon I got to watch, um, I don't know if Ken Cope is here, Ken are you here? How was that? Oh, there he is. So Ken Cope is uh, our new, uh, uh, teaches uh, computer animation, and he was showing films from the 50s about Mars that were animated cartoons that were just absolutely fascinating and, and apparently horrifying at the time. So uh, they had a whole theory about how there were canals that had been built by the Martians, and it was, uh, it, it was really fascinating to watch some of that stuff from the 50s that was, that was produced by Disney and uh, um, to see some of the people who are legends of this. So... Um, it, it's truly an exciting time all week, and there's going to be uh, events set up in conjunction with Friday Night Science uh, on Friday night that will have uh, 3,000 community members attending that uh, for the kids. So I wanted to uh, alert you to a last-minute change in, in our speakers. Uh, Dr. Jim Green was going to be here but could not be here because of some travel issues uh, trying to get from Washington, D.C., stuck in the swamp, apparently. So... Um, but in his place, we have Dr. Sue, Sue Schmrecker, and she's the Deputy Principal Investigator for NASA and JPL's InSight mission. That's the mission that launches on Saturday. Uh, Dr. Schmrecker received her bachelor's degree in geophysics and math from Brown University and her PhD in geophysics from Southern Methodist University. Since joining NASA's JPL in 1992, she has helped plan the goals and capabilities for an advanced Mars rover launch, researched the volcanism on Venus, created instruments to measure thermal properties on other planets, and led a project that delivered two small probes to Mars. While Dr. Green's schedule could not be avoided this evening, he has graciously agreed to do some mini lectures to the public later this week, all of which will be held in room M310, which is if you, the grass commons behind us is kind of on the northwest corner. You would also, those of you who came to college here and took science classes will know that as the whale room. It has a giant whale in it. So. Uh, so uh, we hope that we'll see you guys all around campus, and those, those events uh, uh, for Dr. Green will be Thursday at 3.30, Friday at 5, and Friday at 7. So you're, the public are encouraged to come to, uh, to those events as well. Um, this, is a, this is a great opportunity for us. Here at the college, we talk about how we change the odds for our community and uh, for, for, uh, for NASA and JPL to put this much effort into a rural community college in California. We're really honored by that. And we're looking forward to the presentation. So, Dr. Schmecker, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Well, thanks very much. It's really great to be here this evening. Um, I'm, I'm sorry Jim Green couldn't make it tonight, but I'm really happy to be here. I got to spend the uh, afternoon out at Vandenberg, and I... Uh, Got to sit in the control room. We had a uh, dress rehearsal for our launch on Saturday. So, uh, you know, I got to hear all of the uh, go no goes and the uh, checkouts of the repellent, the weather, the clearing the pad. And, you know, maybe this is all familiar to you here, but uh, it was all new and very exciting to me. So, um, yeah, if you, and I, I, apparently I get to help with some of the, the commentary for launch. So, I'm very excited about doing that. 
Um, so uh, yeah, and, and it's uh, lovely to be here on the stage of, uh, of uh, Notre, Notre Dame in the background, which is actually uh, quite, quite apropos for a couple of reasons. One, I, I uh, had the, pleasure, the privilege of uh, spending a couple months in Paris just recently doing a sabbatical, so that was great to get to do some research for a couple of months. But uh, even, even more importantly, uh, the main instrument that I'll be talking to you about tonight, uh, the seismometer, is uh, donated by the French Space Agency. And our other main instrument, the heat flow probe that I'll talk about, is from the German Space Agency. So we have a very um, you know, international mission. And if you, you know, follow some of the, uh, the briefings and the, and the press, you'll, you'll see uh, uh, all of those uh, space agencies represented uh, here this week. They're all, uh, you know, we, we've all been in this journey together for uh, some of us for decades. And so, um, they're going to be really thrilled to be here, and uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to speak to the public as well. So um, if we could go ahead and start, I want to speak to you about the InSight mission. And our goal is really to uh, understand the inside of Mars, to go deep for Mars. Uh, you know, you, if, uh, oh, that's right, I have, I have the, uh, here's, here's my clicker, OK. So um, we are the first mission to really focus on the interior of Mars. You probably. <laughs> Not advancing. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there have been uh, a number of missions to Mars already, and maybe some of you are familiar with those missions. And we, we've uh, landed uh, a number of uh, landers, rovers on the surface of Mars. We have had a lot of orbiters, and we've studied a lot about uh, what's going on in the surface, in the atmosphere, uh, in, the, in the rocks, in the geochemistry. But um, you know, we still have many questions about Mars's earliest formation, and that's really what the focus of uh, our mission is. Let's see if this works. Ah, how about that? <laughs> no, wrong way. All right, all right, we're on a roll now. Okay. So um, as I said, our goal is to um, learn about uh, the interior of Mars, and you know, we uh, we we like to say we're a good doctor. We uh, are studying the vital signs of Mars. You know, your doctor can't tell uh, if you're healthy or not by just looking at you. They have to uh, know something more about what's going on inside a person, and we're going to be doing that for Mars. So um, we're going to be taking the, uh, the pulse, the temperature, and the reflexes for Mars. Um, and with those uh, vital signs, we actually are going to look into the interior of Mars. Uh, you know, all the rocky planets have this structure. They have uh, at least many of them have an atmosphere, uh, many of them, all of them have a crust, and all of them have a mantle. So um, we're really going to be looking at trying to understand particularly what the structure is, the crust, the mantle, and its inner core. And, th and that by studying Mars, we're not learning not only about Mars itself, but also about the other rocky planets. Um, in particular, uh, you know, we, we have learned so much about the interior of the Earth. We know uh, how thick the core is. We know that it has a solid and a liquid core. Uh, and we know a lot about its crust. Um, and the only other place that we have actually gone and um, done these kinds of measurements is the moon. Uh, for all of these other planets, we have uh, you know, an estimate of how thick these other layers are but we don't really have direct measurements. So our mission is uh, going to take direct measurements and learn about the interior of Mars um, by uh, finally doing seismology and heat flow in, at those planets. And from, from studying those measurements, we can learn about um, not only the early evolution, but also just how geologically active Mars is today. Um, OK, so we know our home planet is uh, warm and active today. You know, each planet effectively has an engine in the inside. Uh, the heat that is originally um, uh, part of the formation of the planet, as well as uh, heat from radioactive, uh, radiogenic decay. You know, we have uranium, thorium, potassium in all planets. And those elements decay, and that generates heat inside the planet. So the heat is what really drives the geologic activity in the surface of our planet. It drives the volcanoes that uh, produce gases that actually make up our atmosphere. So by, we really need to know uh, what's going on in the interior of the planet and how that activity has changed over time to really understand you know, what makes our planet habitable. Why, have, why has it been 
so warm uh, for so long? Why is it still geologically act, act, active today? And so we want to really understand, um, and, and I said you know, before, we, we know quite a bit about the moon. We've had a lot of measurements uh, for the moon. Uh, we know that it's not geologically active today uh, and that its interior is quite cold. But of course, uh, Mars is in the, in the middle in terms of its size. We think it's also in the middle in terms of how warm it is, how geologically active it is. And uh, we want to really uh, understand uh, more in more detail uh, really the, the level of activity today. Um, OK, so uh, to go back to the early formation of planets, uh, we know that uh, bits of rock and dust uh, are swirling around in a disk. As those uh, little particles are attracted to each other gravitationally, they get bigger and bigger until you have a planetesimal. Those planetesimals smash together. Uh, and when you get enough of them smashing together, um, they start to form a planet. So we go from uh, these, these kind of loosely consolidated uh, bits of rock uh, and they start to accrete more and more. And as the gravitational attraction pulls in uh, uh, a large enough uh, number of these particles, you start to form a planet. And the heat of all that impact uh, actually makes the planet melt. Um, but what we don't know very much is about is how it goes from being molten to having this uh, structure that all planets have, you know, sort of the, the skeleton of a planet, the, the, the core, the mantle, and the crust. So, uh, our goal is really to understand more about how that early uh, process happens. It happens, you know, in the blink of an eye in terms of the lifetime of a planet. You know, within the first tens of millions of years, it, it acquires this structure that, it's main, that it maintains, um, you know, throughout its evolution. At least the, the core uh, is stable over time. Um, and uh, for many planets, the crust remains uh, as well throughout its lifetime. Um, so. Uh, one of the questions we want to uh, study also is, um, what are the building blocks? Uh, you know, we, we think that the Earth has a composition very much like a certain class of asteroids, uh, uh, these uh, chondritic asteroids. Um, but, uh, and we think that the other planets are made out of those, those types of materials as well. But um, we, we don't really, we, you know, we only have direct access to the interior planets, right? We have to uh, get that information indirectly, you know, we don't, we don't have a piece of the Earth's core, we don't have a piece of any other planet's core, but by looking at the size of the, these features, the core, the crust, the mantle, we can tell a lot about their composition. You know, just by knowing the size of the core, we can um, determine the uh, pressure and temperature at that, at that depth inside the planet, and that'll tell us uh, what elements are actually stable. So even though you know, we're looking at just these layers, it actually tells us a lot about the composition of the planets and what they're made out of. Um, so uh, in particular, we, we want to know uh, what the information that we have for the Earth. Uh, what, how big is Mars core, and how thick is, is it, its crust? Um, and we want to know how hot is it today? How much of these radiogenic elements are, are inside the planet and giving off heat? Um, how often does Mars have Mars quakes? Uh, you know, we, we've been to the moon with a seismometer, and we've estimated the number of quakes. We, we've recorded the number of quakes on the, on the moon. Uh, a lot of those quakes come from uh, cooling. You know, we start off with these extremely hot molten planets. And uh, for the moon, um, it's still cooling, and uh, that causes it to shrink, actually. Planets actually shrink with time as they cool. That can cause quakes, cause faults to move. Um, impacts will also cause uh, a seismic wave to be generated. Um, of course, on the Earth, uh, you know, we, we, in California here, we know a lot about uh, earthquakes. And um, you probably know they're largely uh, along plate boundaries. We have a system of plate tectonics that causes the majority of uh, earthquakes on our planet. However, Earth is unique. You know, we, we don't see plate tectonics on these other planets. We, even though uh, you know, Venus is about the same size as the Earth, we don't think it has plate tectonics. Um, Earth is unique. Why, why is it the only planet that has plate tectonics? Um, you know, we also know that uh, the Earth has a magnetic field, a dynamo in its core that, that creates a magnetic field. Um, we think Mars may have had a dynamo as well. But um, we want to understand more about its core and what the composition of the core is and what might have driven that dynamo very early in Mars's history. OK, so um, you know, I said that, that uh, once planets are, are molten, uh, they start to uh, cool, and they start to form these layers. So the first step of that is uh, these crystals begin to form. 
and uh, this, is, this is a model for the moon, effectively. So the, as it cools, it begins to, to solidify, and the heavy stuff sinks to the bottom. Um, and for the moon, we know that it has uh, different layers of different compositions. Um, at the surface, it has uh, this, this crust. Um, you know, if you look up at the moon at the night, it's uh, bright, it shines back uh, a lot of the sun's light. Um, and that's, uh, that, that bright material is, um, has a certain composition. It's made largely from, um, uh, it's called an anorthosidic rock, a lot of feldspar, a lot of you know, light colored minerals. And that makes it uh, you know, bright in general as we look up at, at the moon. But um, the same kind of composition would not have formed on the surface of the Earth because the pressure and temperature within the moon is much lower. Um, so, so, okay, yeah, so here's our, our northeastern crust that forms at, towards the end of this process. Um, but you can see that, you know, this model is very much tailored to uh, these, these compositions that form at these pressures and temperatures. And so uh, we don't really have the same uh, crust left around anymore for the surface of the Earth. The plate tectonic processes I was talking about have recycled that crust back into the interior. So this idea of how early planetary formation occurs uh, is really based on the moon. So we, we really need to test out those ideas uh, for a larger planet like Mars. Um, so uh, here's a, a comparison of the size of these planets. Um, the, uh, the pressure and temperature inside the, the center of the moon, oops, sorry, let me <laughs> stop, <laughs> um, is, uh, oh wow, it keeps doing that, okay. Let's, let's move on. That's making me dizzy. Um, so anyway, the, the moon, the moon um, inside the surface, of the, inside the interior of the moon at the center, it actually, the pressure and temperature is um, only about the same as a few hundred miles underneath the surface of the Earth. So you can imagine, you know, the minerals there are really not the same. I mean, think about, uh, you know, graphite, uh, carbon is graphite at the surface, right? But as you go, as you take it deep into the, into the Earth, it's pressure under high pressure and temperature becomes diamond, right? So, uh, you know, we really want to get to those same pressure and temperatures or closer to those same pressures and temperatures as we have inside the Earth by going to Mars. And we'll get a better sense of the processes and the minerals that have formed uh, inside a larger planet. Okay, so, um, you know, Mars has remained cold compared to the Earth. Uh, it's a smaller planet, so uh, just, you know, it loses its heat more rapidly. You know, it's just, it's just a sort of a volume to surface area argument. Because it's a smaller planet, it's going to cool more rapidly. And we're going to go back and look at uh, what we call its vital signs, its pulse, its reflexes, and its temperature. So we're gonna, that will take us back to uh, this early phase of, of Mars, uh, you know, 4.5 billion years ago. And, um, oops, sorry, did I, oh, okay, yeah, okay, sorry, I thought I went too far there. And uh, so uh, Mars is in this perfect spot. It is um, uh, what we call the, you know, kind of the Goldilocks zone because it uh, is not as big as the Earth. Uh, you know, Earth has plate tectonics, and that's really a way in which it loses a lot of its heat. You know, uh, material comes up at mid-ocean ridges, new crust forms, and that causes the planet to lose that heat, where the, the hot stuff comes up from the interior and is frozen at the surface. Plus, we also have subduction zones where, uh, you know, cold uh, material is carried back down into the inside of the planet. So that is, that is a way that, you know, Earth, with its big, massive, interior heat engine loses its heat. But Mars, on the other hand, um, is smaller, and for that reason, it never developed plate tectonics. It doesn't have so much heat. It didn't have to, to lose it so vigorously. And so it has preserved that original crust that it formed with, uh, that started to float up very soon after the planet formed. Okay, but even though it doesn't have plate tectonics, that doesn't mean it doesn't have um, tectonics. Uh, tectonic activity. So we have plates on the surface of the Earth that cause faults, but Mars and, and other planets have still have faults. They still have uh, what we call tectonics. Tectonics just means that the surface is deforming through faulting. And this uh, feature here is, is uh, Vallis Marineris. It uh, you know dwarfs the Grand Canyon. It's this huge rift system, and in fact it uh, is kind of on the edge of this uh, giant volcanic system, Tharsis Montes, which is the, the biggest volcanic system. In, in the solar system, it's, uh, this, this volcanic uh, edifice is uh, larger than Mount Everest. So, uh, you know, even though Mars doesn't have plate tectonics, clearly, early in its history, it had a lot of geologic activity. And we believe it still has um, 
geologic activity today, there's been volcanism you know, within the last uh, one to 10 million years, which by geologic standards is pretty much yesterday. So it does still have a little bit of activity. Okay, um, so uh, as I mentioned, we really are interested in finding out how much heat is coming out of the interior. Um, and that will tell us about uh, the, the um, radiogenic material and tell us about the available energy to drive uh, geologic activity today as well as in the past. By knowing the amount of heat coming out of the, the interior today, we can also um, look back in time. Basically, we can, you know, we have the equations that describe how a planet loses its heat. We know how uh, radiogenic material decays over time. So we know if we have a certain amount of heat coming out of the planet today, we can uh, basically extrapolate backwards to that early phase uh, in, in Mars' geologic history where it was forming these giant volcanoes, forming these huge rifts. And you know, also when the water was flowing in the surface, when uh, the, the atmosphere was uh, potentially warmer and thicker, uh, and, and you know, actually the, um, many of the uh, valleys that were carved by water actually ring these, this giant volcano. And um, so what, we, what we'd like to know is, you know, what is the energy source that drove that volcanism? And, and you know, not only is this the uh, largest volcanic system in the solar system, it's probably the longest lived. We, we have evidence that it had, was active for billions of years, which you know, we have, you know, on the Earth, uh, a volcano might last you know, 10 million, maybe 100 million years, and that would be a very long lived volcanic system. Uh, you know, this, the, on Mars, we have uh, volcanic systems that last billions of years. So we really want to understand the physics of how that system operated for so long. Okay, so uh, this just shows the uh, structure of these planets. And um, we believe that the, the structure may be similar to uh, what's inside the Earth. Uh, but uh, now I'm going to get into, you know, how are we actually going to make these measurements? How does our mission uh, go about uh, getting the interior structure. Um, okay, so we, we um, will measure the size of the core, not only the size, but determine is it fully liquid or is it partially liquid and partially solid, like the Earth's core? Um, what's the thickness and the structure of the, of the crust? Uh, the crust on Mars may have layers, uh, certainly on the Earth, there are layers inside the crust. We have crusts of different composition. Um, we'll be trying to understand, uh, you know, how how homogeneous is the crust on Mars, or does it have some structure? Um, we'll look at the, the mantle, and uh, by learning how uh, seismic waves travel through the mantle, we'll learn what it's made out of, how fast do those, those waves travel, uh, how warm is it in the interior, and what, what heat is still coming out of the surface. Okay, so um, uh, we, this is the, uh, the pulse of Mars, if you will, uh, a, uh, you know, a, a seismic trace. You're probably in California, you're probably pretty familiar with uh, looking at uh, seismograms. So uh, what we will uh, be looking at is how powerful and frequent uh, the activity is on Mars. We have models that we have predicted uh, how many quakes we expect to get. We, we expect to get probably about at least a dozen uh, in our initial mission, about which lasts two Earth years. Um, and by using the location of those uh, quakes, we'll be able to effectively get like an x-ray through the center of, of Mars. The, I'll, I'll show you in a minute how the, the seismic waves travel and um, are, are, are uh, reflected by the different structure inside the, inside the planet. We'll also be using meteorites. Uh, meteorites, will, uh, we, we know from um, the images that we've been taking of Mars over the last um, you know, uh, decades, and we've seen uh, uh, the meteorite strikes accumulate on the surface of the planet. So we have an idea about the rate of meteorite impact, um, but we'll be able to get a more, much more precise estimate of that uh, from, from our mission of, by listening to their, their seismic expression. Okay, so uh, here at last is our InSight lander. And um, we actually are uh, sort of recycling this technology uh, in terms of the lander. Uh, it's a copy of the the Phoenix lander that went sent to, to uh, Mars near the, the poles on Mars about 10 years ago. And so uh, this, this lander, uh, the, the structure of the, the solar arrays and uh, much of the landing system is uh, sort of a copy of a, of a previously used design. However, the instrumentation is all different. Uh, we have um, an arm, which we're gonna use to put our main instruments on the ground, our seismometer, 
and our heat flow probe. Um, we have uh, our cameras are, uh, you know, compared to some other Mars missions, our cameras are pretty minimal. Our, our main goal with the cameras is to find a nice uh, flat spot to put our instruments down. Um, and uh, we have uh, another key instrument, the RISE experiment, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, this is our communications antenna. We, we send our data um, from the surface up to orbiters that are at Mars. Uh, they have much bigger antennas and more solar power, so uh, we take advantage of their ability to transmit more data back uh, because seism seismometers generate a lot of data, so we um, are better off sending them via a relay. Uh, we, take, we also have a pressure sensor. We're, we're essentially going to have a meteorology station. Uh, we have a pressure sensor, uh, temperature and wind sensors. Um, and uh, on, the, on the arm itself, uh, there's a, a grapple. It's, a, you know, it's a, a, actually a five-fingered grapple. If you ever played those games where you, uh, you know, put the quarters in and you try to get a toy, it's, it's kind of like that. We'll be doing that on Mars. Um, and then we have, a, and then we have a uh, camera. So I'll, I'll show you a little bit more about how all these uh, instruments are used. Okay, so uh, focusing first on our um, our seismometer that will uh, take the pulse of Mars. Uh, this seismometer is extremely sensitive. Uh, it can sense vibrations on the surface of Mars that are the size of a uh, hydrogen atom. So extremely sensitive. A tiny, tiny disturbance on the ground, it can, it can pick up and record. And in fact, that's why we have a meteorology station. Uh, anytime there's a gust of wind coming through, we want to be sure that the recording of, um, that we might see with our seismometer is in fact a quake and not just a gust of wind that's causing the ground to, to uh, you know, be, it have some motion. So we um, measure the pressure, we measure the wind, uh, and uh, temperature changes. So really, uh, you know, all of these, uh, even though the meteorology station will be used for great science, and in fact will be the best meteorology station we've had so far on Mars, uh, the goal initially is to uh, make sure that we don't mistake uh, any kind of atmospheric phenomenon uh, for a, a quake. Oh, sorry, I should, I should also say, this is the, the wind, and we'll, we'll see a little bit of, of an animation of this uh, being put on top of the seismometer, but this, we have another wind and thermal shield um, that protects the seismometer, attempting to cut down on any movement just due to wind. Um, okay, so uh, how does that, uh, thanks, yeah. So we're, we're gonna go inside the planet and get a sense of how uh, quakes on Mars or uh, meteorites uh, striking the surface generate a wave. So uh, here are two types of waves, the, the P waves and the S waves. And the, the P waves are in blue, the S waves are in red. So we have both uh, waves that are, uh, move in a forward direction and waves that move sideways. So as they are, in, are interacting with the layers inside Mars, they um, uh, will both be reflected off those layers, and in some cases they'll be uh, refracted, just the way light is refracted uh, through, um, through water or glass. And um, so by, by allowing those waves to uh, start at one point in the planet and travel to our seismometer, it will give us a picture of the layers inside the planet. Okay, and uh, it, as I said, we'll also be able to, to detect quakes, uh, sorry, uh, meteorite impacts. And so this is a, a relatively recent one. And you can tell because uh, you can see all these dark streaks. And basically, uh, when the impact occurs, it you know, brings with it this you know, rush of uh, air. It just kind of sucks the air uh, along with it. And uh, it, it throws out this blast, which clears the dust. So basically, this is clearing the dust off the um, surface. And uh, so the dust is bright. And so these dark streaks are dust free. Um, and over time, over about a year or two, the dust will settle back down and you don't see these dark streaks anymore. So this is a, a relatively fresh quake that's been observed by, uh, probably by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter uh, taking high resolution images um, around Mars. And so from, from those uh, images, we can get the, the rate of, or estimate the, the rate of these uh, impacts, the, the size of the impacts, and so we, we can estimate that we'll see about um, five to 10 impacts relatively close to our lander 
allowing us to uh, get the, record the quakes that are generated by these impacts. Okay, so um, I've been talking about measuring the heat of the planet, and that's done with this heat flow probe. We have to get down beneath the surface of the planet in order to do that. Uh, you know, near the surface, uh, uh, you know, just as on the Earth, there are day-night temperature variations. In fact, those are even larger on Mars because with its very thin atmosphere, it's not very insulated. You know, our, our atmosphere uh, helps insulate the planet and it doesn't uh, cool off so much at night or heat up so much during the day as if we had a much thinner atmosphere like on Mars. So uh, there, there are big temperature variations day and night and there are also seasonal temperature variations. And you know, that, that causes uh, temperature disturbances near the surface. Uh, when we go down um, to a depth of about uh, 15 to 16 feet, we get beneath those temperature variations that are, that are due to uh, seasons and to the day and night changes. Um, and down at this depth, we can actually measure the heat coming out of the planet. Okay, so um, we do that by, um, this is called the mole, and it's effectively a, a self-hammering nail. And I'm gonna show you a little video of this. Uh, but it operates uh, kind of like a miniature jackhammer. It has a, a um, mast inside, which is allowed to hammer down and propel the, the uh, mole underneath the ground. And it has temperature sensors that are trailed behind it. Um, and, and, and that allows us to measure the thermal gradient and get the, the heat coming out of the planet. Okay. And uh, so this is a, uh, a, a video of how this instrument works. Um, this, as I mentioned, is contributed by the German Space Agency. And uh, this, is, this is in particular my baby. I've been working uh, with this team for um, you know, much longer than we've even been working on our mission. So at least, at least 15 years, perhaps 20 years. Um, so uh, I'll be really excited to uh, see this, uh, virtually see it hammering underneath the ground and starting to get its measurements. Um, this shows you uh, from an image of it uh, at depth. And as I said, it, it basically hammers itself down. It has a uh, motor that compresses the spring. That spring is released, and the, the hammer stroke within that um, nail, that nail-looking thing, um, pushes itself down. And here's a video of it being tested at one of the facilities in Germany. Um, and uh, this is sped up a lot. <laughs> um, but it, it, did, it did get to a depth of, uh, you know, five meters, 16 feet, in about five hours. You can see these little uh, temperature sensors here um, as, as they're spaced out along the length of the, of the tether. And you can see it has little, little um, markings on it. We, um, we look at those markings as it, as it goes down, so we'll know how deep it goes. Um, and we also had a, a, a chamber set up at JPL uh, where we um, had a, it, a big um, vat of dirt but we were able to pump it down, so it was, uh, had Mars pressures, you know, one one hundredth of the pressure on Earth, and uh, Mars temperatures, so we could make sure that it would operate uh, under Mars conditions. We actually, uh, you know, discovered that it, there were some serious issues that we had to correct to make sure that it would or operate under Mars conditions. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we have a, a um, rule at, at JPL, and I'm sure at other places, which is test as you fly, and so we made sure to test it under the same conditions that we're gonna be actually digging in. Um, and, and we in fact found uh, that the air pressure made a big difference in terms of the, the, um, the recoil. Uh, you know, when you hit a hammer, it recoils, right? And within that sealed nail, there's also pockets of air. And we had to adjust those pockets of air uh, for Mars pressures rather than for Earth pressures because um, the recoil was uh, too large under Mars pressure. We had to rearrange the masses and make it work under Mars pressure. So we were very uh, happy that we had uh, tested it under Mars pressures, even though initially we weren't very happy to see that it actually hammering backwards instead of forwards. But uh, we were able to fix that, so it's all good. Um, and I think we're coming to the end of our video here, but um, uh, yeah, we're expecting to uh, be able to get down quite deep on Mars. You know, of course it's taking a short time in this video, but uh, will actually take us about um, a month to let that hammering occur. Not because it'll be hammering all the time, but because we will be stopping periodically to make uh, measurements of the connectivity of the soil. And we'll also, you know, we have to have ground in the loop. We have to, uh, you know, send back our data. How did things go? Uh, and then, you know, send up another series of commands. So everything that I'll be showing you in terms of like the mole happening and deployment 
takes much, much longer in Mars because we have to get the data back, make new commands, and uh, keep things going. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to mention that, you know, um, we're doing all of these measurements robotically. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, on the moon, we had the, we had the um, you know, privilege of having astronauts actually put our seismometers on the ground. Uh, and this is, in fact, Buzz Aldrin putting a seismometer down at one of the Apollo stations. Um, and um, I believe this is Dave Scott, uh, who is drilling a hole uh, to put our probes, put, put heat flow probes underneath the surface of um, the moon. So actually being able to do these things is uh, really a, you know, a technological feat to do them robotically. It's, it's a lot harder. Um, so uh, this is, in fact, uh, the Viking seismometer. Viking was the first mission to uh, land on the surface of Mars in 1972. And it took a seismometer. And that's shown, that's shown here. Um, unfortunately, however, uh, seismometers need to go on the ground. And this seismometer was not placed on the ground. It was sitting on the deck of the lander. And so basically it measured uh, gusts of wind. And people have you know, looked at the data to understand wind on Mars. But um, you know, I think they were just wildly optimistic that perhaps they would be able to get a seismic signature through the legs and into the seismometer. But uh, that did not happen. Uh, so uh, we'll, we'll get to go back and do this experiment again and actually place it on the surface as, as seismometers are happier, you know, being on the surface and be able to record that ground motion. Okay, so um, our, last, our last vital sign, we've looked at the temperature, we've looked at the pulse of Mars, and we're going to look at the reflexes with the RISE experiment. So this is, it consists of um, two small antennas that send an X-band uh, signal back to the Earth. So instead of going to the orbiter, the signal goes directly to Earth. We do that because we want to measure the, um, the Doppler shift, the change in the uh, speed of that signal uh, as, it, as it's recorded here on Earth. Uh, that gives us the ability to determine where the lander is located very precisely. You know, it's uh, 100 million miles-ish to, to Mars. We'll be able to um, track this, these, the position of the lander uh, over the course of um, uh, about uh, two Earth years, one Mars year, and at the end of that time, we will have determined the location uh, so precisely that we will know to within 10 centimeters. But really, you know, we're not trying to um, determine the location of lander, but instead, what we're trying to do is see how the surface of Mars is moving about its rotational axis. And um, we actually can use that information to tell us about the, um, the core. And here, here are the two antennas on the side of the, the lander. This is as it was being assembled. And um, I, I, sorry, this movie is, is not working for me, but I'll explain what, what, the, what the idea is with these, um, with these rise antennas. But if you, t if you take a, a raw egg and a hard-boiled egg, and you put them on a table, and you spin them, they spin at different rates, right? Because inside that raw egg, the, um, the, the, the yolk is sloshing around, right? So it just doesn't spin as fast as, a, as that hard-boiled egg. Well, planets do the same thing. Uh, you know, as we go about um, on our axis, the Earth wobbles a little bit, and so does Mars. So what we're really doing it with this experiment is, is measuring the wobble of the planet as it's rotating about its axis. Uh, you know, has, Mars has two small moons. That causes uh, perturbations of its orbit. And by seeing how that, that motion progresses with time, uh, we can really tell about the, the size of the core and uh, whether or not it's fully liquid or, or if it has some um, solid core as well. So you know, it, it's really like that egg spinning on your table. Planets do that same wobble. And that's what this RISE experiment is, is all about. So we're getting basically the, the reflexes as it moves about a, around its axis. Okay. The basic um, idea of InSight is to map out the deep structure of Mars. We know a lot about the surface of Mars, we know a lot about its atmosphere, and even about its uh, ionosphere, but we don't know very much about what goes on a mile below the surface, much less 2,000 miles below the surface down to the center. And this will be the first mission that's going to Mars specifically to investigate the deep inside of Mars. We know that the Earth is habitable, we know that Mars is not. There might be something that we find out in terms of the structure of Mars versus the structure of Earth 
that maybe can help us understand uh, why that is. InSight carries a seismometer which measures the seismic waves that have traveled through Mars from Mars quakes and maps out the deep interior structure of Mars. We're going to also have a heat flow and physical properties probe which will penetrate into the Mars surface about 5 meters or 16 feet to take the temperature of Mars. And it has a, a radio science experiment which uses the radio on the spacecraft to measure small variations in the wobble of Mars's pole to understand more about the structure and composition of the core. InSight will be the first mission to pick instruments up off the deck of the lander and place them on the surface of Mars. I like to say that we're playing the claw game on Mars with no joystick. The seismometer needs to be installed in one place and basically not move in order to get the best seismic data. We also have a wind and thermal shield that will then be placed on top of that seismometer to protect it further from the environment. For the heat flow probe, HP cubed, it also needs to sit in one place, take a while to hammer itself down into the ground and acquire the thermal measurements over a long period of time. InSight is a mission to Mars, but it's much, much more than a Mars mission. In some sense, it's like a time machine. It's measuring the structure of Mars that was put in place four and a half billion years ago, so we can go back and understand the processes that formed Mars just shortly after it was accreted from the solar nebula. By studying Mars, we'll be able to learn more about Earth, Venus, Mercury, even the Moon, even exoplanets around other stars. So you get to hear a few more voices from some people, other, other people on the project. Um, uh, yeah, so I'll just point out a couple of the, the cameras. This one is one that will take pictures as we, you know, we'll, we'll um, reach down and, um, well, first, the first thing we'll do with this camera is we'll uh, take, a, take a selfie and, uh, you know, see our, 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 you know, how, how are we looking on Mars. And uh, we'll start by deploying our solar arrays, and we'll take a, pictures of all around the lander, uh, and make sure that uh, we understand: you know, are our legs deployed uh, fully? Are they are they on a rock? Uh, what what's the status of the lander on the ground? And once we get a sense of the safety of the lander, then we'll start looking around to find a nice place to put our instruments down, and we'll you know be taking a, a 360 degree panorama, and you know get a get an idea of what does it look like uh, in our in our landing zone. And then this one underneath the deck is really aimed at um, the area right in front of the lander where we're going to be placing our instruments on the ground. Um, and uh, all these instruments come together to give us a picture of the inner space. Uh, this is the timeline. Uh, we, you know, at this, at this time, the spacecraft is almost complete. It's, it's fully complete now, I can, I can, I can tell you. It's, it's sitting right up here on top of the, uh, the uh, Atlas V rocket. Um, and uh, we'll be uh, launching it, we hope, on Saturday. Uh, if it doesn't go on Saturday, we have a bunch of other opportunities over the course of throughout May and even into June. Uh, it takes us um, a little over six months to get to Mars. Uh, we, we arrive the Monday after Thanksgiving. No matter what day we launch, we arrive the Monday after Thanksgiving. Um, and uh, so, you know, we like to do things on holidays, Cinco de Mayo to Thanksgiving. Um, <laughs> and, then, and then we'll start our surface operations. So. Um, you know, uh, the uh, video sh took about two minutes. Uh, we'll take about two months to actually get our surface, our instruments placed on the surface, and uh, we expect it'll take about a month, uh, giving all the commanding and so forth, uh, for the heat flow probe to um, uh, make its way underneath the surface. Um, this is uh, just a, a few other pictures showing the hardware as it was getting ready to be uh, packaged up and sent out here to California. This was in. Uh, in Denver at Lockheed Martin. And uh, uh, has anyone send their name to Mars? All right, awesome, awesome, me too. So uh, if you were uh, you know, on our Mars website or uh, you know, follow our social media, uh, you, you will have seen there was an opportunity to send in your name and get your uh, ticket to Mars. Uh, and there's a little chip that is placed on the uh, lander. Uh, so uh, 2.4 2 million people are going to send their name to Mars with us, which is great. Um, and, as, whoops, and as you know, may, or maybe you don't know, we're, we're going to be the first uh, planetary mission to launch from Vandenberg. 
which is really fun for us here in California. Um, we, uh, we can do that uh, because, uh, as I said, you know, we were kind of a, a, a copy of this other lander. And that lander was designed to go on a bigger rocket, but, oh, sorry, on a smaller rocket. Uh, so we have a bigger rocket that we're launching on. And so uh, given that combination, we can launch um, uh, towards the west, right? We want to launch our rockets over the ocean in case something goes really badly. Uh, in Florida, uh, when you launch, you launch to the east uh, and with the rotation of the Earth. Uh, because we have a relatively small payload and a big rocket, we can la launch against the Earth's rotation. So uh, that's why we get to come here and you know, have sea, or sea otters instead of alligators. So you know, <laughs> it's a good deal. OK, and so yeah, as I said, we'll take about six months. And um, this is the, uh, of the aeroshell, or sorry, the cruise stage. You know, we have this, um, oops, sorry. We have a, um, a uh, solar array that provides power to the vehicle as it's being carried to Mars. Uh, once it gets to Mars, it loses that, um, that cruise stage. And uh, the, it goes into the atmosphere. Uh, it's going 1,400 miles per hour. And so even that thin atmosphere causes a huge amount of heating um, of, this, of the, the air shell. So we have this material that actually um, burns up as it is uh, going through and helps shed some of that heat. So um, it's this, this is the early phase where it slows down uh, very dramatically. The whole entry takes about seven minutes. Um, one of the things that's uh, also a first for our mission is we're going to be carrying two CubeSats. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with CubeSats, but the goal is to uh, have these very tiny spacecraft that can do very specific functions. And these are the first, and you know, we've, uh, people have put a lot of CubeSats uh, in orbit around the Earth to, uh, you know, do things related to weather, or uh, there's actually one that started to look for exoplanets. Um, but the, so far, we haven't sent any uh, CubeSats beyond Earth's orbit. So uh, we'll be launching the first two uh, to go beyond uh, Earth's orbit. They're called uh, MARCO. And um, they'll be launching um, with us on Saturday. They, they travel to Mars separately, not, along, not on board our spacecraft. They travel separately. And what they're going to be doing is helping send data back um, as the spacecraft is coming through the atmosphere of Mars. Um, you know, we, we can't uh, get that signal, we can't do any commanding, right, during that, that seven minutes. So uh, we want to be able to uh, record uh, all the events that happen as it is going into the atmosphere. You know, we, it's, um, there's the, the spacecraft, because it's, you know, inside that capsule and it's going so fast and it's, you know, burning through the atmosphere, it can't actually send data directly back to Earth. But it can uh, send data uh, just to these CubeSats. So they'll be in position to record our, our, our data during entry. And you know, we've sent many missions to Mars. Not all of them have worked. You know, it, it, when it works, it looks easy and it, and it looks fabulous. But there have been many missions that have failed going to Mars. I've worked on missions that have failed. Um, and what we really want to do is be able to get all of the data we can as it's entering. So that if there is any problem, we'll understand what happened and we, and we won't make that uh, mistake again, essentially. So that's really the function of these CubeSats, is to send data back during entry. Um, we are going to this spot right here on Mars. It's smooth and flat. Uh, you know, really, all we were looking for is a place that um, met the engineering requirements of this lander and had a place that um, had the right kind of soil for our heat flow probe to dig down. So, uh, you know, the pictures, will, we believe, will show it looks kind of like Kansas, no corn, but it's going to be flat and boring is, is what we're looking for. But because we're a seismic mission, right, we, we wait for the, so the quakes to happen on the other side of the planet, and those waves travel to us. So, you know, from a scientific standpoint, we didn't need to be in any given location other than some place with enough soil to allow us to dig down. So any place we go is good for the seismometer. Um, Okay, so uh, we'll be there about uh, 30 days before we find a nice spot to put down our instruments, and then we'll start uh, collecting the data. In fact, we probably won't actually get our mole deployed at depth for several months. Um, I think it, may, it might be as much as four months before we really get it down below the surface of Mars. Um, our data comes back through the Deep Space Network. There are three antennas like this 
uh, around the Earth so that you can always have one that's pointing towards Mars. Um, this is the, uh, the Goldstone one uh, in here in California. There's also one in Spain and one in Australia. And here is a, a group of uh, some of the people that have worked on Inside. This is a, a group at the Lockheed Martin facility in Denver. But uh, we'll, be, we'll be snapping some more photos this week. There's a, there's a huge group of people, hundreds of people that have worked to uh, make this mission happen. And uh, we're uh, really looking forward to you know, connecting with as many people as we can and uh, you know, hopefully getting you excited about our mission. Uh, there are uh, public outreach people have done a great road show in California. I got to uh, help them out in San Francisco at the Exploratorium, uh, but uh, they've, they've set up a number of events, and I'm sure there are more here this week. So uh, you can uh, go see some of these events. Um, they have a, a scale model of the lander, and people will be uh, talking more about the mission. So I hope you can check some of, some of those. And uh, there's also all these sites where you can follow us uh, at... Uh, Twitter and Facebook, uh, you can you can find out how to watch the launch if you're if you're not planning on uh, going out towards Vandenberg this Saturday, but you can you can watch it online uh, or you can find out how to watch it uh, probably from your backyard. So there's lots of options. All right, thank you very much. We have a few, a few minutes for questions. Yeah, please. I have some. Okay. <laughs> so, because, you know, I'm a liberal arts major, so I taught history and government. So nice. um, when you cut the planet open like that, it scares me. <laughs> and, uh, and, but, but first, I, I saw, at first I saw like the Insight, the first video of the Insight said that you're going to launch in March of 2016. So I thought maybe you guys had buried the lead and told us you got a time machine. But uh, <laughs> I'm guessing you're just delayed. You were delayed two years so far. Yeah, we, we were delayed two years. Um, you can only go to Mars every two years, so if you have a delay, you have to wait that long. And uh, we did have a technical problem. Um, you know, we because we have this extremely sensitive seismometer, it sits inside a vacuum sphere, and um, there's there's not actually one seismometer, but six. There's um, two horizontal and one vertical of the long period and the same for short period, and there are. Um, I think it's 100 and uh, it, it's, I think it's close to 150 connectors. And so you have to get all those connectors to uh, you know, keep the wires connected into that tether and still have a vacuum sphere. And there was one pin uh, that didn't seal. And so we were not able to get the kind of vacuum seal that we needed for that seismometer. And in fact, you know, the spacecraft had been delivered here to Vandenberg and we were gonna integrate the seismometer there. So we thought we were really, really close to launching, but in the end, we made the decision to pull back uh, because we didn't want to send our seismometer and not have it operate properly. So we had to, we had to have a delay. Mm -hmm. sure. So um, when you talk about the mantle and the, and the, uh, the, the crust. crust and the mm -hmm. mantle, so how, how thick is the crust? So on the Earth, the crust is between about, um, 30 kilometers or so underneath the oceans, and it's a different composition here. It's basalt in the oceans. And then um, on the continents, it's much thicker. It can be up to as much as 100 kilometers, so you know, about, um, um, what is that, how many miles is that? That is 60, 60, 60 yes, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so on the Earth, it's quite variable, and, and we actually think it may be variable on Mars, too. We think it may be thinner in the north than thicker in the south. Um, one last question that I'm going to turn over here is um, the how do you make sure that the instrument lands right side up? And can it move once it's there, or is it wherever it lands, it's where it is? Wherever it lands, it's where it is. So um, we didn't see the whole um, entry, but it comes in on an aero shell, and that is um, the, the mass is distributed, so it always goes in, you know, with the cone side, the legs down, basically. And then it goes, and then, it, then a, that, that shell pops off, and, you have, and then it's on a parachute for a significant time. And so that's, you know, the parachute's gonna make sure it's in the right orientation as well. And the parachute is popped off, and the last little bit, it comes down on rockets. Okay. And in fact, it can orient itself. We want it to be uh, aligned north-south, actually, so it actually 
can orient itself as it's coming down on those rockets. So yeah, we haven't had a problem like that with rockets in terms of it not getting in the right orientation. Do the CubeSats get video of that? No, Duh. no, they don't. Yeah, they don't have cameras. <laughs> All right. So uh, questions from the audience. Oh, we'll start over here, and then we'll pass the microphone up. Well, this is uh, sort of from a movie that I saw not that not that long ago, but you know, I, I think I think that it was with Matt Damon, but he was stranded on Mars, something like that. But it, in the movie, it showed that there can be a really serious issue with winds and sandstorms. Is is that a problem? So uh, that was a great movie. I, I really enjoyed it. <laughs> it showed the excitement of trying to figure things out and engineering things. Um, but uh, the atmosphere on Mars is one one hundredth the the density, the pressure, and so. Um, you know, there are big dust storms on Mars. You can have, you know, dust storms that, that enshroud the, the entire planet because the, the dust can get uh, lofted high up into the atmosphere and, you know, it, the dust storms do definitely happen. However, um, you know, the, the pressure of the wind on Mars is kind of like this. It, it doesn't blow anything over. It doesn't have the, the force to actually blow anything over. So that was artistic license, but it was a good movie. <laughs> You can't, you can't grow potatoes without a heat source either. <laughs> I'm, from, I'm from Maine, so I, I know this. <laughs> um, so is terraforming, terraforming Mars a realistic idea? Um, oh, um, Maybe you should explain what that is first. Yeah, so terraforming means making the planet uh, into a, uh, making it more habitable, basically, like creating more atmosphere um, and making it warmer and you know, leading to a place where you can grow potatoes. Um, and I have to say, I am not an expert in that. Um, and there are people that have been studying that. Um, so I would say, you know, in, in, to my knowledge, we don't have the means to do that now. But you know, there, is, uh, there is certainly water in the ice caps. There's uh, water uh, you know, maybe 10 feet down or so. Uh, in, in a shallow layer, um, sort of, uh, you know, at near the poles, maybe uh, north of south of 45 degrees latitude. You know, so there, there is, there are sources of water on Mars. Um, you know, if you could get all that water into the atmosphere, it would certainly change the climate. Um, and so, you know, um, theoretically, it's possible to change the climate. Uh, I don't know uh, of studies that show how you can do that, you know, realistically yet. So, uh, not, not that I know of, but it's not a crazy, crazy idea. <laughs> so, my question was, why did you choose Vandenberg instead of Cape Canaveral? Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, two, two reasons. Um, one, uh, you know, there's a lot going on at the Cape. And uh, for, there's, a, there's a, um, a company, Launch Services, that actually manages launches uh, for NASA in Florida and here. Um, and so uh, they wanted to really just kind of balance things out. And uh, because we had the ability to launch from uh, Vandenberg, they wanted us to come out here. And uh, you know we were excited to try that out. Uh, hello, so, hold on, all right. So I'm aware the NASA budget is uh, rather small, um, to say the least. Uh, so my question is, if NASA had a budget of similar size to that of the military or other, uh, uh, other, uh, <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> what do you think would happen? <laughs> well, uh, yeah, there are a lot of objectives that we would love to accomplish if we had an enormous budget. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, would likely happen is we would have the ability to actually send astronauts beyond beyond Earth orbit, beyond, you know, to either go to the surface of the moon, go to Mars. Uh, you know, that's uh, something that uh, NASA has been studying for a long time. And, uh, you know, given the budget and uh, given the political willpower to do that, it, you know, there, there, that has been studied uh, a great deal. And, you know, I believe it's technically within our reach to do that. So um, I think that is one of the things that NASA would prioritize. 
Uh, I can give you a whole suite of other missions that we'd love to do. Uh, I'd love to go to take, send missions to Venus, my other favorite planet. Um, there are uh, you know, uh, ideas to send um, uh, other missions to some of these icy satellites that may have oceans at depth. Uh, you know, we haven't explored, um, really we haven't explored um, uh, Uranus, Neptune, these gas giant planets, which are, are very much like many of the um, exoplanets that we see around other stars. So, uh, yeah, we have, we have a very long list and we'd be uh, thrilled to do many exciting things. So, you know, write your congressman. <laughs> are you aware that uh, we launched a... 92 to the moon, a Navy satellite from Vandenberg. Oh, I, I, guess, I, I guess I'm not aware of that. That's, that's exciting. It was a Titan II as the booster, and the Air Force sold it to the Navy for $50 million, the launch, and the satellite cost 27 so it was a $77 million program that the Navy paid for 1992. Excellent. Thanks, I didn't know that. Hi. Uh, was there a reason for uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, lander uh, to be uh, launched on these uh, Atlas V? Was there any other vehicle in consideration for this, for this launch? And is that, I guess is that also related to um, the uh, selection of Vandenberg Air Force Base as the uh, uh, launch site? Um, yeah, we, we did uh, consider other rockets. Uh, in fact, um, you know, SpaceX's uh, Falcon 9 was under consideration. Um, at, the, at the time when we had to make a selection, um, it hadn't been fully tested and vetted, so we didn't go down that path. Um, but uh, in terms of uh, the impact on launching from Vandenberg or from Kennedy, uh, that rocket can launch from either location, so that wasn't the definitive factor. How far does the rocket go before it releases the, the self-powered piece? How does it yeah, so that happens about um, two hours. So, so it's a two-stage rocket, and so the first one um, uh, uh, is you know, is jettisoned fairly rapidly after um, after launch, but the uh, the final crew stage is released about I think it's about two hours after we launch, so it takes a while. Yeah, yeah, it's moving pretty fast, but yeah, it's it's not too far from Earth. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, you're hammering probe up here. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> so the heat probe hammer. Um, you have contingency for if you hit hard rock versus loose soil. They've studied all that, I'm sure. So yeah, um, we, we've done a, a lot of testing of it, and um, you know we we try to figure out how big a rock can we actually smash and go through. And so yeah, we can we can go kind of go through rocks that are you know a few inches across, um, and if it's a it's a big rock, we've been able to actually kind of skitter around the side of it. Um, now, if it hits a you know a flat, massive rock, that's that's game over. Um, but uh, we've been very careful to select the site uh, such that uh, we don't believe there is a um, a massive layer of rock like that in the upper um, in the upper like 30 feet. Uh, and and luckily we have these very small impact craters that we can image at high resolution. And those uh, serve as a way to, uh, you know, peer into the subsurface. So, you know, an impact crater forms, it excavates material from depth. And what we've been able to do is look at um, the size of the impact crater that actually kicks up rocks. And so we can see as we, go, as we transition from the very small craters to somewhat larger impacts, um, they start to kick up rocks, and the larger craters. So based on the, um, the, the depth at which that material is coming from, we can say that there is no um, competent layer of rock within that upper about 30 feet where we're landing. And so that's part of what went into that selection of the landing site. Now, you know, could there be a single rock down there that could stop us? Yes, it's possible. But um, we have uh, done our best to select a site 
where uh, that won't happen. And, um, but you know, once we start hammering, we can't retract it. We, can't, we don't have a second go. We just keep going and do our best to get as deep as we can. And in fact, um, you know, if we don't make it all the way to that depth, um, we can still get a measurement. Uh, in fact, we have um, what's called a radiometer that will look at the, the uh, temperature at the surface. So we can get, a, get an estimate of how temperature is changing uh, day, night, and over the seasons. So if we have to, we can sort of uh, back out some of that temperature variation that's near the surface. It'll, it'll cause us to have a bit more error in our estimate of the heat flow. But um, you know, we can still get something uh, if we don't get all the way to depth. Mm -hmm. OK. Right here. Uh, great presentation, by the way. Very uh, insightful. So I learned through watching some of these specials on TV about Spirit and Opportunity, how they had a lot of issues with the dust impacting their solar arrays and mm -hmm. literally losing power. And, mm -hmm. You know, it was scary. They didn't know if the mission would be over. So I'm curious on this mission, have they, especially since it's a slanted um, orbiter or ship, so to speak. Lander, yeah. Right. Have they done anything to address the solar arrays so they could like shake them or twist them, dump them, or they just think that it's not going to be an issue? And secondly, uh, what stands out about Venus for you? <laughs> um, so we don't have any way to uh, you know move our solar arrays to try to get the dust off, but you know we do have a, a long experience of things on the surface of Mars, and um, so far uh, you know missions haven't ended just due to the to the dust. You know, so far, there's been uh, dust devils and gusts of winds that have come by and cleaned off those solar arrays. So we are um, you know, anticipating that same uh, you know, benefit from the wind. And in fact, in this landing site, uh, you know, we can see trails of dust devils that have gone across the surface and, and cleaned the dust off. So you know, we, ha we have reason to think that in this area, there is that kind of uh, uh, wind phenomena that should help us clean it off. Um, you know, the dust will fall, and uh, we just have to hope that the wind will also blow. <laughs> um, uh, uh, Venus, um, yeah. So uh, I also study Venus and am very enamored of that planet, in that it is uh, our sister planet. In effect, you know, it's uh, only five percent smaller than the Earth. It is, you know, has this uh, similarly massive interior heat engine that drives geologic activity. You know, if you look at the surface of Mars, uh, it has literally hundreds of thousands of impacts that tell you that the surface, on average, is very, very old. You know, on average, uh, more than 3.5 billion years. Uh, you look at the surface of Venus; it has a thousand impact craters. Um, so. On average, its surface is very geologic act active, like, like our own planet. But there's so much we don't know about how that planet operates. Uh, it, it seems to have the same bulk composition, but it didn't develop plate tectonics. Uh, you know, why, did, why does only Earth have plate tectonics? And plate tectonics is part of the system that helps regulate Earth's climate on the, on the time scale of hundreds of millions of years. You know, uh, Venus is um, 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Its atmosphere is 90 times more dense, almost all carbon dioxide. On Earth, we have that same amount of carbon dioxide, but it's locked up in carbonate rocks. And some of that carbonate rock gets recycled back into the interior, into the mantle, through subduction. So it's that process of plate tectonics that helps uh, regulate on a really long time scale how gases are released from the interior and cycled back in. So you know, I'd love to understand uh, why doesn't Venus have plate tectonics, and what role does that have play in its overall habitability. And you know, when we see uh, Earth-sized exoplanets around other suns, uh, you know, are they, they going to be like Earth or are they going to be like Venus? And without really understanding Venus, we can't really answer that. Does Venus have a, a substantial magnetosphere? Uh, so uh, Venus does not have a magnetic field. Um, uh, it, it does, you know, the solar wind does um, uh, reflect, uh, or it is, it, it does uh, divert around the planet. It does have an ionosphere, so the solar wind interacts with the upper atmosphere, but it doesn't have a magnetic field. Yes, up here. Uh, so I'm from Mars, you're from Venus, we meet on Earth. <laughs> uh, my question is from concept to launch, the time frame for the, for the mission. And the other thing is, 
how do you mitigate launch G's with the sensitivity of your seismic? Yeah. yeah. Um, well, so let me answer that second question first. So basically, um, you know, conceptually, a seismometer is a mass on a spring. And um, we basically lock that mass down during launch so that it doesn't rattle around too excessively and similarly during landing. And so uh, that mass is effectively released when we get to the surface of Mars. Um, and then in terms of the, the time frame uh, for getting this mission to happen, um, you know, this is a, was a competitively selected. Uh, you know, many of the Mars uh, missions are, um, uh, we call them directive missions. NASA says, okay, JPL, you will do this mission. Um, this mission is a bit different. It went through a competitive process. It's, it's a somewhat um, lower budget mission than some of the Mars missions. And we were uh, selected to go forward um, in the, the final go ahead in uh, 2010. Um, or actually 2012, they got the, with the, uh, the first, we made it to the second round in 2010 and then got the final go ahead in 2012. Um, but uh, the idea of doing seismology on Mars has been around for um, uh, 20 years and, and these instruments have been developed and matured over that time frame and through various different avenues, uh, you know, uh, especially Bruce Banner, the person you saw in, in the uh, video, the PI, uh, has uh, proposed and proposed and proposed again. I mean, uh, I don't know how many proposals he's written, honestly. Uh, you know, probably 10 to try to make it happen. And so, uh, you know, just like when, you know, missions fail when they go to Mars, you have to keep trying. Uh, we had to keep trying to, uh, you know, make this, make this mission happen. And it's, uh, you know, same with, for me, I, I'm trying to send a mission to Venus and, uh, I've gotten turned down three times, but I'm going to keep trying. <laughs> Top right. I, um, since this, a uh, little bit top right, right here. Uh, since this mission is uh, investigating more of the internal portions of, of Mars, is it also going to be investigating if there's any other new minerals or resources or even water, um, giving us more insight into, uh, into that, if there's, uh, if there's resources like that in Mars? Yeah. Well, um, in terms of water, um, you know, we know that water once flowed on the surface of Mars billions of years ago. Um, and the question is, uh, where did all the water go? Uh, is it, has it all been lost off the, off the top of the atmosphere? You know, as the, the water is, um, uh, uh, rises through the atmosphere, it can, at the top of the atmosphere, it can break down into oxygen and hydrogen and it can get stripped off. So some water has certainly been lost that way. Uh, but there may also be more water um, under the surface of the ground. You know, we know that there's some ice. But the question is, at uh, deep depths, is there actually liquid water? Um, and one of the biggest variables is the heat flow. The heat flow tells us, uh, the rate at which the temperature increases inside the planet. And so that will give us, um, you know, an estimate of when you get to a warm enough temperature to actually have liquid water. So we'll have an idea of, um, you know, is it, is it down to a depth that we haven't been able to explore via radar? Uh, what might we expect there to be liquid water down there? Now, it's probably, if there is liquid water today, it is so deep that, you know, I don't think future astronauts are going to be able to access that. But it does give us an idea of, um, how that depth to the water table has changed over time. You know, I said the planet cools over time, so we can extrapolate backward to understand where that, the depth of that water would have been in the past. So that's, so that's one thing. And then that also, and, and similarly by, by knowing the, the thermal evolution, and like we, we want to know, well, so the thermal evolution will help us understand the composition, but also, you know, we don't know if the crust is, has a uniform composition or if it has, um, you know, if it has a different composition in the north versus the south, by looking at the, by understanding the density that, sorry, that the thickness of that crust, we can infer does it have a different composition from one place to another. So that also tells you about the minerals that are available um, as a potential, um, you know, catalysts for an environment that could have been habitable. So, so indirectly, we learn about those kinds of, of kinds of issues. Uh, space seems to be one area where there's uh, a, a lot of international cooperation with 
different countries that are in, in uh, different venues aren't so cooperative. And I can be lost the use of the space shuttle that now to get to the International Space Station and use the Soviet, or the, excuse me, I'm sorry, but that was Freudian, excuse me, the uh, Russian uh, la launch vehicles, but the only ones that seem to work. And there's a lot of rumors about China developing a manned space program and <laughs> possibly in not too many years having manned uh, uh, launches uh, to the moon. Will, if, if China does that, will NASA have any involvement with uh, China that would be helpful or just, you know, basically keeping us all working together as like a team? <laughs> yeah, so um, right now, China is the one country that NASA is not cooperating with. I mean, we even, co we, you know, we cooperate with Russia, we cooperate with Japan, you know, pretty much every country that has some kind of interest or space program, we cooperate, except China. And I don't know all the details, but apparently, uh, I think there was some data that was withheld, or I don't know, some, some, some particular issue created this, you know, ban against uh, working with China for NASA. I think that that will get resolved at some point. I mean, it's kind of crazy that there's only this one country that we don't cooperate with. So I am hopeful that it will eventually get resolved because that's the only country we don't cooperate with at the moment. That's great. We don't want the scientists to get too involved in the politics. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we, we cooperate. So, We're good. So let's thank Dr. Schmecker one, <laughs> Schmecker one more time. Thank you. Um, I also should introduce uh, Brian and Stephanie, who are here in the front from NASA. They're, uh, they've come out for that. Uh, for, our, for our students, I think um, one of the exciting things, Brian, uh, we, we got to go to dinner a couple of months ago, and we had a great time. And, and he talked to us about something that was on display here about the kind of jobs you can have working in the space industry. And it's not all just about loading up rockets and shooting them. There's, uh, there was, the, you know, you saw the, the graphic animation and the web design and uh, even marketing. There are so many kind of things that go on in NASA and the, and the JPL that are beyond actually being the person who pushes the button to launch a rocket and, and mm -hmm. being a geophysicist. And I mean, th there's so many things that you can do if you're, if you're interested in that, in that kind of work. And so for our students who are here, you know, Give, give some thought to that, because I remember back, nobody told me that was a job, right? I mean, <laughs> so so um, we're grateful for you being here. We have a little gift for you. Just say thank you for coming to Hancock. It's a bottle oh. of our Aviator Champagne. Oh, awesome. I, I well, might even have an occasion for that. <laughs> so it is a sparkling wine. Excellent. Thank we you very much. We don't want the French being mad at us. And uh, in a notebook there. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming. This was, uh, this was fascinating it. and uh, <laughs> probably lots of people wanting autographs up there now. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and